So thank you, first of all, for the invitation. Uh, I'm really very happy to be here, of course, seeing uh, old friends. And this is the place where I grew up. And, um, and uh, basically, what I'm going to do with you today is to tell you about a long standing um, problem that we have had uh, since joining uh, Cambridge, um, talking to people, right? And that is the role of cy the importance of cytoskeletal proteins in the nucleus and their connection to gene expression and, more recently, genome organization. Um, and so, um, first of all, why are we interested in genome organization? I'm sure, I mean, I don't need to go into details uh, to this uh, audience, but basically what happens uh, is the chromosomes are organized into territories, right? They have uh, what they call a, a non-random uh, but variable localization as, in, you know, in two defined, well-defined territories. And, but, but when, in, nowadays we can zoom into these chromosomes by doing, uh, for instance, advanced uh, genomics, which is what we do in my lab, but in particular high C and ataxic and these sort of things combined with uh, deep sequencing. And now we know that these chromosomes are organized into, chroma into compartments, which are actually quite large. And if we can zoom into these compartments, compartments that, by the way, can be either active or inactive, and they are defined respectively as A or B compartments. And if we can zoom into these compartments, which we can do, then we see that they are made up of domains or subdomains, known as topologically associating domains. Right, so, uh, and, and all this, co this complex organization comes together because there are long range uh, interactions, intra or inter uh, chromosomal interactions among different loci. Now, so, so that tells us that the, the genome must be both dynamic and stable at the same time. And this is a, a, a key feature because at the end of the day, that's how genes come together and they are co-expressed or co-repressed. Um, and, and this, of course, impacts a lot uh, cellular function. And so we'd like to define uh, these genes that are co-expressed or co-repressed uh, as gene programs. And as I said, we focus on this, uh, we focus on how these mechanisms occur in development and differentiation. So we do that by looking at the three different uh, kind of layers, we look at chromatin regulation, we look at transcriptional regulation, and, and also post-transcriptional regulation. I'm not going to tell you all of these things at the same time, but I'm going to focus on chromatin regulation and transcription regulation, their impact, and how they are in intertwined with the way the architecture of the genome is established. Um, and in particular, as, uh, in particular, as the, um, the, the, you know, the title of the talk, kind of uh, highlights, uh, we are looking at the role of cytoskeletal proteins, in particular beta-actin, in uh, uh, gene expression regulation and genome organization. And everything started literally when I um, left uh, Cambridge, uh, the MRC. Um, I was talking a lot with Alan Weeds, who was a historical PI at the, at the Medical Research Council, and he was always bugging me with this idea, how come there is so much actin in the nucleus? You know, but 20% of cellular actin actually is in the nucleus, because actin doesn't have an NLS, it's not particularly... And so, but at that time, people knew already, you know, that there was a lot of actin in the nucleus. And so he, he actually helped me in these initial findings, because he actually raised a very, very specific antibody. And a very specific antibody, and these tools, actually, we combined it with this uh, system, right? This is uh, a, 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 a dipteran insect that I started working on when I moved from Cambridge to the Karolinska Institute. It's called Chironomos tentens. It's a non-biting midge. And just to give you an idea from an evolutionary perspective, this not that far from an Ophelous mosquito, but it's not a biting, a biting midge, and also related to Drosophila. But not being an evolutionary person, I'm not sure how the connections are. But it's a, a very nice system because at its fourth instar larval stage, right, it has got very large salivary glands, and these salivary glands are made up of very large cells. They have a peculiar saddle shape. And uh, the nuclei are really huge. You can decapitate the larva and then squeeze out the salivary glands. 
and then isolate the chromosomes in a nice and non-disruptive manner. And so using this system and the beautiful antibody that we made together with Alan Weeds that cross-reacts uh, uh, with nuclear and cytoplasmic fractions, in, you know, and with actin in both nuclear and cytoplasmic fractions, we performed immunohistochemistry, and this is really a historical experiment for me. It's a milestone experiment because what you see here is that uh, so these are just chromosome four and chromosome one, for as an example, but there are you know chromosome two and three be behave in the same way. You see that there is this discrete pattern that is reminiscent of transcription sites with the anti-actin antibody, and in particular these are exceptionally large. Um, transcription puffs called Balbiani rings, one and two. Okay, they are heavily stained with actin, just like the other chromosome, chromosome two and, and three. But the amazing thing here is that if you pretreat uh, chromosomes with, uh, with RNAs, what happens is that you lose staining completely. And this is pretty unambiguous because it tells us that there is an association. This association is RNA dependent and therefore most likely transcriptional dependent. Okay, so I'm not going to bother you with all the data here. We performed cryoimmune electron microscopy and quite a lot of other things. And we demonstrated that actin associates with the nascent RMP and accompanies the RMP all the way to, the, to, to, um, to polysomes, bound to a subset of heterogeneous nuclear ribonucleoproteins. In a subsequent paper, right, we mapped one of the proteins as being one of these H and RMP proteins in Chironomus as being one of the interactor, uh, direct interactor with actin. We mapped the binding site. Uh, we showed by, as I said, electron microscopy, transmission electron microscopy that both actin and uh, this HRP65, is just to give you an idea, this is in, 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 uh, in mammalian cells, this would be the homologue of PSF, the transcription, the, co the co-activator. Um, and so they co-localized uh, with, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, in nascent RMP particles. But uh, surprisingly at that time was that if you break the interaction between actin H and HRP65 with a competing peptide injected into these large nuclei, what happens is that you abolish BRUTP incorporation, right, which is a way of mon in vivo, which is a, a way of monitoring transcription elongation, not global transcription, okay? So the effect is comparable to actinomycin D. And that put us on track because then we started saying, okay, this is a, a, a potential role in uh, transcription regulation. And it's not limited to, uh, to chironomous tendons because one can always argue these are big cells and, blah, and so you know, things might be different. This happens also in mammalian cells. And uh, in fact, what we discovered is uh, that, that actin interacts with HNRMPU, also known as scaffold attachment factor, or SAF-A. And the interaction is actually conserved with respect to HRP65. The binding site is very conserved. And this interaction is important. Uh, happens on the CTD of the polymerase, so the carboxy terminal domain. And it's required to recruit the hat PCAF. Okay? So we started actually you know, getting mechanistic, mechanistic insights into how actin could mediate transcription elongation. So basically to, load, to facilitate the loading of epigenetic marks to lower the nucleosome barrier for the elongating polymerase. Now, uh, so, but the, the, the impact of actin is not only at the epigenetic level, but, but it's also in, in terms of, of remodeling, chromatin remodeling, and you know, not necessarily my lab, but many other labs have found that actin is a component of chromatin remodeling complexes. Uh, and, and probably the best characterized is, uh, is, is Swaisniff or Buff. This has been characterized extensively by Gerald Crabtree in his lab. And uh, now we have the crystal structure, uh, which has been uh, recently determined. And so now we know that actin binds to the actin-related protein, ARP4, and interacts with BRG1, which is the, the catalytic subunit right, of, uh, of BUFF. And uh, it, in fact, it is required for the catalytic subunit. Now, w what is very important is that this interaction with BRG1 is actually nuclear, not cytoplasmic. And here we have an IP that we recently added to a paper that uh, has just been accepted in Nature Communication where we show that this, the BRG1 and actin can only be co-precipitated from nuclear, but not from a cytoplasmic fraction. So we are talking about, I mean, and this is something that I emphasize a lot all the time, 
uh, it, we are talking about a nuclear event, okay, all the time. Now, uh, we actually reported that this interaction not only is important, the interaction between actin and BRG1, not only is important for, 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 for the catalytic activity of BRG1, and this is something that was characterized by Gerald Crabtree, but it's also important for the genomic deposition uh, of BRG1. So these are ChIP-seq analysis performed uh, in the presence and in the absence of actin, of beta-actin, in embryonic fibroblasts that was published, that we published in, in PLOS Genetics a few years ago. And what basically what you see is using a, 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 you know, an anti-BRG1 antibody, we see that basically the protein uh, is, is, is actually present across all mouse chromosomes, but is lost in the absence of beta-actin. This is just a, a, a zoomed-in image of chromosome 11. Now, um, recently also we showed uh, that this uh, regulation, this so actin-dependent BRG1 activity and, and recruitment is important for um, ac gene activation. Uh, in particular, uh, we actually showed that if you don't have beta-actin, um, essentially uh, CBP-beta cannot be recruited you know, upstream the, uh, um, the open reading frame of CBP-alpha and due to a chromat local chromatin compaction, and then CBP alpha is not activated. And this impacts on adipogenesis. Now, um, so, uh, now, what is also important to realize is that this actin that we have in the nucleus is actually functional. It's not something that is different from the cytoplasmic fra uh, fraction. It's the same. It's just the same. We have, uh, so, uh, in, in fact, uh, in, the, in the cell nucleus, there are plenty of actin regulating proteins, uh, you know, that are important for polymerization, depolymerization, you know, you name it. This exactly the same proteins. We know that actin actually is actively imported now into the nucleus through an importing dependent mechanism in complex with the actin binding protein cofilin that has an NLS, and it's exported through exporting six in complex with profilin, which has a nuclear export signal. So there is a very tightly regulated nuclear, uh, nucleocytoplasmic shuttering that impacts on gene expression. In fact, the more actin we have, the, more, the higher the level of transcription. This is work from Maria Vartianen's lab in Helsinki. It, as I said, it is a functional actin, and you can see that now we know that actin in the nucleus polymerizes very dynamically. And this is work from uh, Robert Gross. Uh, and that, that has been actually the main source of concern when talking about actin in the nucleus. People could not see polymers or actin filaments. Now people can see actin filaments thanks to chromobodies okay, that are expressed directly in the system. So because of all this, then we started thinking about the possibility that uh, actin the connection between actin and gene expression regulation is also intimately uh, related to the possibility of having the correct organization of the genome during differentiation, because it's our favorite, uh, I mean, cellular function. Uh, and, um, and so for this reason, then we started developing a system to study right, the, 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 this precise question. This is actually in collaboration with Christophe Fampe in Belgium, in Ghent. Actually, they made a beta-actin knockout mouse model, which surprisingly at that time, and not anymore, was not lethal from day zero, but it's embryonic lethal. It dies at stage 10.5. That is precisely when key developmental pathways kick in, right? Like neurogenesis, you name it, osteogenesis, blah, blah, blah. And so we made embryonic fibroblasts from these uh, embryos, and these are just Westerns that show you, so we have knockout cells um, that you see they do not express any actin, any beta actin, but they overexpress gamma and alpha smooth muscle actin. But, and then we have a heterozygous condition when only, where only one of the allele is disrupted. Um, but you see that no matter whether you have an increment in the other actin isoforms, the total level of actin more or less is the same. Okay, so the cell somehow manages uh, some kind of regulation. But what is interesting is that the uh, cytoskeleton, so the cytoplasmic cytoskeleton, if I may do this, make this difference, is uh, actually okay, 
because you have alpha smooth muscle actin, you can stain it with phalloid. Okay, so in fact, we can maintain these cells, we can propagate them, etc. Uh, and so we started investigating. In, so in this system, we started investigating gene expression regulation. And so the the, the, the first study that we uh, that came out using this system was really re very, uh, relatively recent, 2016, when I was transitioning between Karolinska and NYU. And, and in that study, we showed that the, the chromatin within the ribosomal DNA transcription unit is extremely compact. And you have an upregulation of this epigenetic mark, which is an, a repressive epigenetic mark. And it's compact to the point that this T0 element, which is a promoter proximal enhancer specific for POL1 transcription, does not allow binding of TTF1, the kick starts, uh, the, the kicks start transcription. Okay, so then, of course, when, when I moved, the finalized the lab move I mean, to NYU, etc. I recruited a very talented postdoc from, from Cambridge, Shin. And, and, th and then Shin started wondering, but listen, is this effect limited or restricted to the ribosomal DNA transcription unit, or perhaps it's something more general that affects uh, the, 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 basically the entire, the entire genome? And so for that, what, what he did was to perform, uh, to, s to do basically high content phenotypic profiling. And we have this machine in the, in the lab, uh, it's a robotic platform that um, yeah, allows you to do, uh, so it's an imaging based, I'm sure you're not familiar with that, it's an imaging based study to look, uh, to, and so in other words, quantitatively establish if there are changes in uh, and so we use, uh, we, 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 we labeled cells with H3K9 trimethylation, which is a repressive mark, and HP1-alpha. And you see here that in the knockout condition with respect to wild type, we have an increase, global increase in H3K9 trimethylation and HP1-alpha, which is the heterochromatin binding protein 1-alpha. There is also a major change in the nuclear area. Right here, you have a comparison between wild type heterozygous and, and knockout condition. And so, if you look at this, you do uh, confocal microscopy on these cells and you look for HP1 alpha, you see that HP1 alpha is lost from uh, the nuclear lamina. Right? HP1 alpha is a marker for heterochromatin, right? And so, we take these results as a way of showing that you have loss of heterochromatin segregation at the nuclear lamina. You have an accumulation of, uh, uh, I mean, HP1 alpha in the nucleus. Uh, which is totally abnormal, right? So we, we, we did RNA-seq, so we profiled, the, we profiled the cells by RNA-seq, and there is a lot of differential gene expression, and, uh, and so there are genes that are upregulated, you know, this is the, uh, and the RNA-seq analysis is relatively in line or, you know, compatible with proteomics. Uh, so here we do not have changes in H3K9 trimethylation at transcription start sites. So this data is chip seq for H3K9. Uh, but if you look at genes that are downregulated, you have an upregulation of H3K9 trimethylation at transcription start sites. So, uh, so altogether, so we then came up with this uh, little model and we started thinking perhaps what actin is doing is actually maintaining heterochromatin in the cell or in the nucleus. It's important for kind of homeostatic regula regulation of heterochromatin. You know, in, 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 the, in the presence of actin, you have uh, normal heterochromatin segregation at the nuclear lamina. In the absence of actin, you have uh, essentially a redistribution of heterochromatin inside the cell nucleus, and nuclei also look bigger, okay? And, uh, and, 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 you know, again, I mean, this is important for me to always mention and remind people, this is a nuclear effect, because if you express, if we, which we did, right, in the same paper, uh, if you express an NLS-tagged actin or beta-actin form in the knockout background, okay, what happens, so here you see the staining, what happens is that you actually uh, uh, rescue the level of uh, H3K9 trimethylation. Remind you, these are quantitative. Uh, these are quantitative results. So one dot is 5,000 cells, more or less. Okay, so we're talking about quantitative data, and you also re-establish or induce cha uh, changes in the architecture of the cell nucleus because nuclei shrink; they become uh, kind of more elongated. And you also, you know, induce changes again or rescue changes in gene expression, at least partially. Mm. 
So our working model then, a little bit going a little bit more into, you know, in depth in, in, into this idea, is that uh, acting as a component of the buff complex facilitates, you know, heterochromatin tethering, which is mediated by buff, to the nuclear lamina. Buff actually interacts with lamina-associated proteins. And inside the nucleus, we thought, or we think, that acting as part of the buff complex counter facilitates uh, the counteracting of uh, polycom repressive complexes. They, you know, they, they work, they, come, you know, they, they, they kind of, um, what do you call it? They, they, they don't like each other, in other words, right? I mean, uh, and so in this sense, it's important for, uh, you know, um, heterochromatin segregation, but also for maintenance of heterochromatin inside the nucleus. And we think that this impacts on, uh, on, on genome organization, therefore, and differentiation. And to address this, and in fact, sorry, before that, in fact, when you, perf when you, when you do R uh, RNA-seq analysis on these knockout cells, cell, uh, you know, genes involved in pluripotency or genes involved in neurogenesis, adipogenesis, and osteogenesis are totally dysregulated. You know, this is just a visual way of showing it. And so to address these things in more, more precisely, what we have done uh, uh, in the past couple of years is to develop uh, kind of in vitro differentiation models, okay? Uh, because, of course, I mean, the problem with beta actin is that we cannot take the mouse model and isolate uh, neurons because the, 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 the mouse is, embryoni is embryonic lethal. And so what we do is, so we have, uh, we have established um, kind of protocols to do, to study neurogenesis, adipogenesis, and osteogenesis. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this story and this other story. I'm leaving this away, but it's basically all published. Um, and so why neurogenesis again? Neurogenesis, because if you look at, uh, if you, if you, if you look at genes, I mean, simply that are differentially expressed, you see that, and you do pairwise comparisons, what you see is that genes involved in neurogenesis are totally dysregulated, and I showed you before. Right, so what Shin did, my postdoc did, was to establish a, a trans-differentiation protocol to convert embryonic fibroblasts to neurons. Uh, and so what we do, using, using a cocktail of chemicals, so there is no uh, viral, virus, uh, there is no viral transduction, I think it's a cocktail of chemicals. Um, and, and so we have, uh, keep in mind, we have these three cell types, wild type, heterozygous condition, and knockout condition. So it's uh, about a few weeks, I mean, right? I think it's like 21 days. And so what we do, we characterize the cells as they move into the you know, differentiation process by immunostaining and morphology, and then by RNA-seq analysis. And so here, these are how, so these are the fibroblasts, the initial fibroblasts. This is the, the end of the protocol. You see that these cells have been converted into something that are not fibroblasts anymore. They, they are branched, the branching is different, whether or not you have wild type, heterozygous or knockout, but, but, but these are neurons because they express numerous markers, and this is just to show you a few of them. See that they express MAP2, they express synapsy. I can show you a similar, I mean, this is basically a similar thing. So again, the, the embryos, uh, isolation of the embryonic fibroblasts, reprogramming, and so here you see that uh, uh, quite, quite clearly, right, that uh, during the time course of the experiment, MAP2 which is not expressed at the beginning becomes expressed more and more until it's totally expressed in a, in a kind of homogeneous way. And then, I mean, uh, and it's comparable to heterozygous and wild type, okay? But then we wanted to establish here if there is a loss of uh, um, neuronal identity, right? Which is uh, looking in a bit more into cell fate. And so, as I said, we performed RNA-seq on these induced neurons. This is a principal component analysis. You can see that uh, um, the different cell types, in particular, hetero, you see this, uh, okay, so this is the MEF condition, this is the induced neuron condition, uh, and so you see the heterozygous and wild type cluster together, but they're totally different from knockouts, similar in the induced ne neuronal condition. And what is interesting is that that was rewarding for us because when we looked at genes that are commonly upregulated, we're only talking about neurogenic go terms. Right in these pairwise comparisons, whereas whereas when we look at genes that are downregulated, it's mostly genes related to fi fibroblasts, 
So suggesting really that these, gene, these, these uh, embryonic fibroblasts were really turned into neurons. Um, but what is interesting is that when we started comparing uh, um, you know, the, 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 the induced neuron condition with the MEF, uh, the corresponding MEF, what we see is that as we proceed from wild type to heterozygous and, and neurons, and, and sorry, and knockout, we have more and more, so less and less neuronal genes that are um, expressed essentially. And, and this is evident also here, right? So, if, so these are the same go terms, uh, but if you, let's say for instance, if we look at nervous system development, see that these genes are not expressed in, uh, in the fibroblast condition, but they are upregulated in the uh, neuronal condition, but this uh, upregulation is actually dosage dependence. So the less actin you have, the less they are expressed. Okay, and so this is important for us because it tells us two things. One, the MEFs are not committed, right, to become neurons. They become neurons because we push them to become neurons, but also they tell us that there is a dosage uh, type of, um, uh, so it's dosage dependence, it's beta actin dosage dependence, right? So which suggests again that there is a direct role of actin in, in this. And so we don't know yet what's going on, but we believe that these neurons, the lack beta actin, are simply of a different subtype. And just to give you a flavor of the type of thinking we have, uh, um, so we, we've looked a little bit more closely at this synapse uh, go term, and we found that um, genes involved in glutamatergy, so, for so if we look specifically at vesicular glutamate uh, transporter, see that it's upregulated, but the uh, EAAT receptor is uh, downregulated. The closest the glutamatergic cycle is downregulated. But if you look at GABAergic synapses, you see that exactly the opposite, right? The vesicular uh, GABA um, transporter is downregulated, suggesting that there could be a switch between excitatory and inhibitory type of neurons. And so in this sense, um, um, a switch in the subtype. Plenty of genes involved in proneuronal pro and neuronal genes are also dysregulated. I'm, of course, not sparing you all this, I mean, because there are plenty of genes that we tested. Uh, so these are IGVs, just to give you an idea, to start giving you a flavor of the mechanisms. You see that, for instance, if you take this ZIC1, which is a proneuronal gene, a transcription factor, um, the gene uh, in wild type condition, uh, you see that H3K9 trimethylation is simply not there, but it's upregulated in terms of occupancy in the knockout condition, whereas the opposite happens in, in the case of BRG1. Okay, and this is just to give you a flavor of the way of thinking that we have. So we wanted to bring this more to a global way, and uh, for that uh, we looked, uh, we actually um, uh, compared the wild type neurons and knockout neurons, uh, and we searched for up. We essentially classified uh, gene, you know, genes into upregulated, downregulated, and non differentially expressed. And then we look. We went back to the original fibroblast to look what happens to the to H3K9 trimethylation and BRG1 by ChIP-seq. Okay, and so it, you see what happens here is particularly interesting. In downregulated genes, you have a upregulation of H3K9 at transcription star site and we have a loss of BRG1. And so if, uh, I mean if I skip this, uh, I, you know, so we started thinking across more or less along these lines, which is a model that was suggested a few, a few years ago by John Gordon in, in one of his reviews. It, you know, basically what we think is that actin by is ensuring that you have an active buff complex, it facilitates its recruitment, and this ultimately is important for, um, for activation of what we call occluded genes that are important, those that are important during differentiation. Now, the question is, is this a, a general model? It's something just typical for neurons, and that's why we wanted to look at other differentiation models. And I, and I just wanted to focus on this, which was actually published last year in Advanced Science. And uh, again, osteogenesis. Why? Because plenty of genes involved in osteogenesis are dysregulated when we look at the RNA-seq data uh, performed in, in knockout cells. 
And so this is actually a student of mine, an undergraduate student, Tami. Tami was very successful, very good. Now she's uh, into a PhD program. And uh, she is the one who actually set up the, an in vitro osteogenesis assay. And, um, and so again, it's a type of, it's a chemical based approach. And, um, and again, we have these three cell types and we want to convert them into uh, osteoblasts or osteocytes, which are the, um, the cells responsible for the production of the, for ossification in general. Okay, and so again, we do the, uh, the same analysis done by IF, but done by morphology, RNA-seq and so on. And so here you see the morphology in the case of, if you look at wild type, you see that you have these cuboidal uh, cells that are um, these basically osteoblasts, uh, but you, don't, you basically kind of lose them in the knockout situation where you have more this dendritic type of cells that are compatible with uh, more osteocytes. Uh, are these uh, cells really functional? Yes, they are very functional. You can do staining with alizarin red, that stains for calcium that produce, uh, produced by cells, secreted by cells. And, but, and, and this is very striking because you really see the phenotype. Uh, wild type, they start producing uh, some kind of, secreting some kind of calcium uh, only after day four. And then of course this you know, increases as time passes and, you know, and, and et cetera. But the knockout cells, the, 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 the staining is a lot more intense already at a very, a very early stage. You know, that kind of gives us, start giving us an idea that those, you know, basically osteogenesis is dysregulated in this uh, system, in the absence of beta acting. Plenty of genes involved in, uh, you know, again, you know, to make sure that the, the pro protocol works, we have checked by qPCR expression of many genes involved in, uh, in, in osteogenesis, and that's the case. Um, but uh, then what we wanted to characterize a little bit uh, f further from a functional point of view, and uh, we, we performed, uh, uh, so, and basically we looked a little bit more closely at the material that is secreted by these knockout cells. This is uh, day four. If you look a little bit more closely, you have these things, that these kind of vesicles or particles. I don't know what they are, but anyway, the masses, not well defined, seem to be of crystalline origin. So we isolated them and, uh, and then performed uh, uh, scanning electron microscopy. And this, you see, we were very, very uh, amazed by this because you have this amazing crystalline production that turns out to be pure hydroxyapatite, um, not as good as the wild type. So somehow, you know, the loss of beta actin by, re by dysregulating gene expression, you know, we get to a phenotype, which, I, I, I mean, it's, it's as, you know, as somebody who's done molecular genetics is kind of interesting, right? It's, that's what you want to do. And, and it makes you think also about the potential for, you know, what it means from a clinical point of view, right? Mutations in the act acting gene that could actually be tuning more or less these processes. Anyway, uh, so there is a hypermineralization, that's the bottom line, and so we think that there is loss of osteogenic activity, identity. In this case, we were able to map uh, more the mechanisms, and that's why I went to advanced science. Um, because, you know, when, when it comes to ossification, the uh, mitochondria are key uh, organelles because what happens is that you have an accumulation, basically you have an accumulation of calcium containing vesicles in mitochondria and then they are, uh, you know, secreted into the cytoplasm and then further secreted in the extracellular matrix where you have, where, where the extracellular matrix is very dense and then you, they serve as nucleation point for, well, crystallization of hydro production of hydroxyapatite. And so based on this, we did, uh, we performed uh, transmission electron microscopy and we set to do that at day two into the um, differentiation protocol because otherwise we would see too much uh, stuff, right? it would be dirty. So these are, these are wild type cells, okay? They look normal into, um, uh, I mean, at day two into the differentiation protocol. These are knockout cells, you see the, the, the crystals, the hydroxyapatite crystals, but above all what you see is in mitochondria, you see the accumulation of these uh, 
um, uh, dots which are actually calcium containing vesicles which is much more or considerably more that, let's not forget that this is day two not day 14 into the, the compared to wild type so so we think that mitochondria are dysregulated somehow uh, due to the fact that gene expression is dysregulated and therefore you have this uh, uh, exceptional hypermineralization and um, and uh, yes, so in fact, uh, gene genes are heavily dysregulated, in particular those involved in oxidative phosphorylation. So what you see here, let's see if we just focus on oxidative phosphorylation, that's the time course we have, zero for days and 14 days, while type, you see, and then here, this is a knockout situation, and, and, and it's color-coded, uh, just to you know, make sure that you know, we just get the message immediately. See that, for instance, at, 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 zero, at day zero, you already have an upregulation of a set of genes involved in oxidative phosphorylation. So somehow, the transcriptional status of these cells to start with in the absence of beta-actin is uh, not favorable or, you know, for, 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 for correct differentiation, right? Uh, and this is the case also in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in for, uh, for um, uh, genes involved in the regulation of osteoblast differentiation. I mean, of course, we're not going to go through the names of the genes, but you see in, in red here you have negative, uh, sorry, in um, red you have positive regulators of uh, osteoblast differentiation. In blue you have negative regulators, and you see that in the knockout cells, all these positive regulators of gene exp of um, of osteoblast differentiations are immediately on, um, just like the genes involved in oxidative phosphorylation, um, which is actually telling us, uh, and that's the bottom line of this study, that somehow actin in the nucleus is involved in the temporal expression of genes during differentiation, right? Because these genes should not be activated, compared, as you can see in the wild type. That's the message. Uh, that we are currently um, delivering and we would like to understand a little bit further. But taken all together, uh, so we then began to hypothesize concretely, more and more concretely, that there is a problem, there is a, actually an implication in the functional architecture of the genome, right? Because if you have uh, a, a role in temporal gene expression, right, somehow you need to modify, and that's why I emphasized that the genome must be dynamic but stable at the same time, right? Because it has to change during gene expression. And so to address this, uh, I was super lucky because then I started stepping into an area that is not my favorite, not favorite, but I didn't, uh, sorry, I didn't say that, but it's something that is not in my background, bioinformatics. And, um, and so I was very lucky because I actually recruited a talented PhD student from NYU, uh, Reza, and, um, and so, so we generated, just to give you an idea, and then we go a little bit more uh, for kind of further into details, we generated ataxic data to study chromatin accessibility uh, in the absence of beta-actin, and then we generated high c uh, seq data to study the, whether the, the set of in genomic interactions is modified. Ataxic, I'm sure you don't have to go into this, into details, but basically it's, uh, it's an assay that is um, based on this transposable element, TN5, which is engineered to have adapters. And so TN5 interacts with open uh, chromatin, chromatin regions. Uh, if the chromatin is too tight, it cannot interact, right? And so, and so if you combine this with, with, with deep sequencing, then you can get quite uh, high resolution insights into chromatin compaction. And so to cut a long story short, Reza analyzed this data and what he found in this, and the results are actually summarized in this volcano plot, that there are regions that are, of chromatin regions that are both upregulated and downregulated. And these, this, is, uh, this, this uh, study has just been, this the study has just been accepted in nature communication. So you see that there are regions that are both upregulated and downregulated, meaning regions that are open and regions that are closing in the absence of beta actin. And if you look at genes that are uh, regions that are downregulated, you see that among them there is a considerable proportion of genes 
of transcription star sites, right? When we annotate them. Um, so we looked a little bit more closely. Uh, so you see that a, 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 the majority of these transcription star sites is lost, as expected, as I showed you before. There are only a few of them are gained. And if we do an annotation, if you annotate this material, then you see that plenty of there are plenty of genes that are involved in differentiation, in particular also neuronal differentiation. Okay? And um, what is interesting, and goes back to the model that we had before, is that 28% of these are polycom targets. And that was super exciting for us, because the, the models that I showed you before were just pure interpretation of the data. Now we start having direct insights into the possibility that there is a dysregulation of the balance between BAF and PRC. Um, and so what we did then, we did a clustering, ana clustering analysis of a toxic signal in differential peaks, and we identified two chromatin clusters by doing that. These are density maps, and these are average signals from, from uh, attack seek. And just to cut a long story short, I mean, I think that the two plots above are very, very revealing, because they show you that uh, in, you know, in cluster one, you have an opening of the chromatin as you go from wild type to knockout to, sorry, wild type to heterozygous to knockout. The opposite happens in the case of cluster two. So basically, in cluster one, we have an open chromatin. In cluster two, we have an, a closed chromatin. And this correlates very nicely with gene expression. In cluster one, you have an upregulation of uh, uh, transcription um, you know, um, relative to, to wild type. And, and it, you see that is, again, dosage dependence. In, the, in cluster two, where you have a closing of the chromatin, you have uh, uh, a downregulation of gene expression, of transcription. Um, so we then uh, performed ChIP-seq analysis. Uh, we have uh, antibodies to BRG1, EZH2, which is the catalytic subunit now of polycom repressive complexes, and, uh, and then we have H3K9 trimethylation and H3K27 trimethylation, which is the facultative uh, repressive epigenetic mark. And ag again, what you see is that you have a loss of BRG1 at transcription star site, you gain EZH2, and then you have an increase in H3K9 trimethylation, an increase in the facultative mark. This is global. Okay? Then we look to what happens in, in cluster 1 and cluster 2 that I showed you before. And uh, a cluster, cluster 1 is a little bit messy, and I don't, we still don't understand why. Because you have, I mean, not messy in the sense that uh, the data is not solid, but in the sense that, okay, BRG1 as expected more or less there, easy H. 2 is upregulated, although it is supposed to work with PRC2. And then you have, uh, um, I mean, H3K9 trimethylation doesn't change, and H3K27 trimethylation doesn't change. I mean, it makes sense with respect to the transcriptional level, but we don't have a mechanism to propose yet. But cluster 2 is very interesting because you have. Uh, up, you lose BRG1, you upregulate EZH2, and, and then you have an increase in H3K9 trimethylation and an increase in H, H3K27 trimethylation. Now, the trick here is to understand EZH2, because EZH2 is, as I hinted before, is upregulated both when, when, when you open the chromatin and when you close the chromatin. Um, and so we looked a little bit more closely at the differentially, uh, differential peaks in uh, ChIP-seq analysis. You see that basically in the absence of beta-actin, you only have gene, uh, peaks that are upregulated, okay, in the case of EZH2. Okay? These are the annotations. There is a good proportion that falls into the category of transcription star sites. And then you have, again, developmental genes involved in differentiation, and ch et cetera. Uh, and so uh, to, to understand why you have, uh, uh, you have uh, um, I mean, this widespread increase of EZH2, what we did was we looked at uh, the distribution of BRG1, attack signal, and H3K27 trimethylation across the genes that are upregulated when it comes to the occupancy of EZH2. And what you see here is interesting, because you indeed have a loss of BRG1, but the chromatin doesn't change. 
H3K27 um, trimethylation is upregulated. So this means, this is an actually an important result, because it means that it's not because EZH2 is recruited to the transcription star side that we have changes in the chromatin. It is most likely because you have uh, a core recruitment by EZH2 of some kind of repressor. Okay, and in fact, what we show here is the REST, which is an important uh, transcription factor involved in pluripotency and all sorts of differentiation aspects, is actually upregulated exactly in cluster 2, which is the one where you have uh, uh, a compaction of the chromatin in the absence of beta act. And this is data from embryonic stem cells, right? Okay, so uh, to, con to conclude this part, uh, actin depletion leads to changes in chromatin accessibility. These changes can be classified into two main clusters. Uh, cluster 2 exhibits a closed configuration that is compatible with loss of BRG1, followed by recruitment of EZH2 and presumably a core repressor. Uh, and therefore, uh, I mean, we started thinking that tactin might be regulating the uh, genomic deposition of the buff complex and maintain a chromatin architecture compatible with transcription. And to test this possibility, as I hinted before, we looked at, uh, we performed high seek high seek is uh, chromo chrom basically is a, is, is, you know, is a way of doing chromosome conformation capture uh, studies, but it's combined with deep sequencing and allows us to look at the hierarchical distribution of, no, sorry, hierarchical organization, the multi-layer organization of the genome, as I said before, into chromosome territories, compartments, not territories, sorry, compartments, subdomains, and find out if there are changes in long-range interactions. This is a schematic representation of the assay. I don't think I need to go through this. But just to give you an idea, these are the cell types on which we perform high C-seq. We have uh, uh, heterozy our heterozygous condition, wild type, uh, knockout cells expressing GFP uh, constitutively, knockout cells, uh, knockout cells uh, and then knockout cells expressing human NLS-tagged beta-actin, and um, knockout cells expressing mouse and a less beta active, okay, denominator like that. So then basically what we did using the high CSIC data, what we did, we constructed a matrix, an interaction matrix at 500 KB resolution, and then we did clustering based on the Spearman rank correlation. And two things here are important to remember. One is that the, based on the amount of actin, the different cell types correlate, right? You see that heterozygous and wild type, they correlate. You have knockout cells that correlate. And then you have cells expressing, uh, constitutively expressing actin in the nucleus also correlate. But what is important, the, the bottom, uh, uh, the, the take on message is that there are significant beta actin dependent changes in genomic interactions, okay? So that starts telling us that um, the architecture of the genome is dependent on, on beta act. So then we bind the genome into 500 KB um, inter non overlapping intervals and um, essentially use the uh, principal component analysis to classify them into compartments, either compartment, compartments A or compartment B. That, uh, the, and, and basically, these compartments are reflected by the fact that compartment A uh, have, uh, a, by convention, a positive sign. The other one have, by convention, a negative sign. And then we plotted PC1 values to start making pairwise comparisons between the cell types. Okay, and so here you have a comparison between wild type and knockout cells. PC1 values and PC1 values from the um, principal component analysis. So what you have here in the top gradient are um, bins that are classified as compartment A, uh, they are positive. Here you have bins that are classified as B compartments. And here you have bins that actually switch in the, in the absence of beta actin from compartment, uh, so here in red, from compartment B, now they become uh, compartment A, and vice versa, from compartment A, they become compartment B. So what we call a compartment switch essentially, that is induced by, by loss of beta actin. And uh, so annotations of this stuff here shows that you have those genes that are switching between A and B or B to A have a considerable number of genes. So here we are talking, just to give you an idea, we are talking about 
five to six percent of the genome that switches in the ab from A to B or B to A compartments in the absence of beta actin. Okay, which is a number that is uh, normal. I mean, it's not uh, low at all. It's uh, during differentiation we are talking about eight to ten percent. These are not. This is not a differentiating cell line, right? These are cells that we use as models. Um, yeah, so beta actin dependent changes in genomic interactions then lead to compartment switching. So then this is again the same plot, but I removed uh, um, or, or compartments that do not switch, huh? so A or B, so you see more clearly the switching. And this is the pairwise comparison between heterozygous and wild type, same concept you see that uh, the extent of switching is considerably less in the heterozygous condition and uh, again in line with this dosage effect and, but it, what is remarkable is that if you reintroduce um, actin in the cell nucleus right mouse actin in the cell nucleus in the knockout background you actually rescue the degree of switching Right, so basically, this switching is reversible. So you reintroduce actin in the cell nucleus, and you, um, yeah, to a, to a certain degree, of course, we cannot do it uh, um, um, in a quantitative manner. Uh, whereas if you have cells expressing GFP instead, this doesn't happen. Uh, so, uh, so the effect of beta actin then the, of nuclear beta actin seems to be at the compartment level in terms of genomic architecture. Is there any effect uh, at uh, in subdomains or domains that are part of these compartments? These are high C classical high C matrices. This is in particular chromosome six, an example uh, in the wild type condition and in the knockout condition. And what you see here, just to cut a long story short, this is just an, enli an enlargement. You see that TADs do not change. These are TADs, right? Uh, as also revealed by the insulation score that doesn't change, and also by the distribution of CTCF that doesn't change in the beta actin compart in the, in the beta actin knockout. But if you look more precisely as a, at a switching at a switching region of the genome, which is from blue to red, what you see is that attack changes, the levels of attack changes, so they, it's much higher. You see the H3K9 trimethylation is considerably higher. You have a loss of BRG1, you have an increase in EZH2 and an increase in H3K27 trimethylation. So indicating that you have, uh, that, that, that there are epigenetic changes that happen concomitantly with the role of, uh, you know, with, with, um, with compartment switching, okay? Um, yes, so uh, this is the summary of what I wanted to tell you. Uh, beta actin depletion leads to loss of BRG1 genomic deposition. And you know, to cut a long story short, we think that uh, beta actin dependent compartment switching is reversible, supporting a direct role for the nuclear beta actin pool in regulating chromatin and its the spatial distribution. And this is the model that we have been uh, that we have recently proposed. So, of course, if you have beta actin, uh, beta actin binds BRG1, BRG1 is active, buff is recruited, no problem. If you don't have beta actin, EZH2 is preferentially recruited, presumably with the rest of the PRC2 complex. And then you, you can have repression, but you can also have activation. And then you have these two clusters, cluster 1 and cluster 2. Cluster 1 is probably, sorry, cluster 2, the repressed one, is actually generated because EZH2 f f facilitates it recruitment of core repressors that lead to an epigenetic state that is compatible with repression. Whereas for activation, we don't know the mechanism, honestly, but uh, we think that this leads to upregulation of genes that are potentially involved in differentiation. And, and, and these two states are compatible with compartment B or compartment A at the, genom at the um, genomic level. More importantly, these are the people who have done the work in my lab. Sheen is an extremely talented postdoc. Uh, Tami, very good students of mine. Ro Robertas, Reza, my PhD student. Thomas, my postdoc. And all these are, you know, friends more than collaborators. Okay, and I'll stop here, ready for lunch. Mm -hmm.